evening. Welcome to the FIMS presentation series. My name is Jay Yogeshwar from Hitachi Data Systems, and together with Loic of Trisco, we're going to talk to you about some design considerations in building an appliance for FIMS repository service adapter. So this uh, presentation is going to be in two parts. I'm going to talk about object storage as a FIMS repository, uh, so the typical characteristics of what is part of an object storage and how Hitachi implements this object storage. And uh, Loic is then going to talk about the adapter concept and also some scope and design considerations followed by a live demo. So what is an object storage? But before we address what an object storage is all about, I think it's instructive to look into uh, the content repository requirements as part of an end-to-end -end production environment, and more typically for an asset management for film and video production. Um, so in the beginning, there is ingest and capture, which requires extremely high performance out of the storage. So typically, these are taken care of by block storage with some kind of a shared file system because those are capable of extremely high throughput, right? Uh, they're also capable of dealing with streaming files as opposed to static files. Um, there's requirements around file access. So file access is, is good when you have uh, operations like viewing proxy videos and uh, also for things like transport applications. So, so typically your block and NAS storage are very good for production, for post-production storage. However, once the content is finalized, you want to store that in long-term repositories or near-line repositories, and that could be an object store or tape. Right? Uh, so object storage is, is really ideal because it also has characteristics associated with cloud and also hyperscale, which means you can store billions and billions of objects. So, so this is kind of the uh, use case. So let's get into the object storage part of the use case. So we need object storage for several reasons. Today, media workflows have started to move to the cloud, which means that you have to centralize the data management and protection and reporting associated with that. Um, you have a very distributed environment, so it's a, it's a distributed database, or you can think of it as a distributed card catalog. So you want to access the same data from remote locations. You want to be able to ingest from remote locations into the centralized repository. So in effect, you have to remotely provision the edge devices, and you have to be able to treat the, the edge or the devices of the spoke as a, a small NAS file share, for example. And more importantly, at the center, uh, you have to have the object storage that's capable of maybe even active-active type of topology, where should one of them go down, you need to still be able to access your metadata and your content. So, so there's a cost associated with that, but we all know the cloud use case. If this is optimized in cloud, which means you could use it as an elastic store. So, so the, the attraction of using object store for FIMS repository is that you can completely leverage not just the archive capabilities, but also the cloud capabilities. Okay. Um, so a very quick pitch about Hitachi's implementation of object store. So it's called the Hitachi Content Platform. And the nice thing is this was built both for preservation and cloud. Um, so at the back end, you see my many different types of storage. So that could be you know, your modular storage, enterprise storage, or it could even be um, a deep archive storage. But the important thing is that this is accessed through REST APIs. Um, so the contents platform can store, in this case, about 80, manage 80 petabytes of data and 64 billion objects. So that, that's a lot of objects. And, and sure, in media, we know that we need that kind of scale. But more importantly, uh, cloud-based object storage also need to have 
concepts of multi-tenancy and multiple namespace, so you can partition your clients. Uh, so workflows associated with a particular client should not mix with that of another. Uh, we need to make sure that they're accessible not just through REST, but also through other protocols. And finally, uh, you know, today we talk about multiple cloud environments. Uh, you might have a private cloud, but you may also have public cloud like Amazon and uh, Azure, etc. So the ability to burst into public clouds but still maintain the security are all important features of uh, an object storage, especially the one that uh, Hitachi has created. So you've got these incredible challenges, uh, so incredible features of the content platform. So the challenge is, how do you use that as a FIMS repository? Right? So let me talk about some, some aspects of an object storage that's really ideal for FIMS. Right? Um, so an object storage is different from traditional file storage in that an object consists not just of the essence file, but also two types of metadata. One is the system metadata. As you're familiar, so these are kind of the technical metadata associated when the file was created, where it was created, um, and some of those file properties that we associate with user files. But there is also the possibility to put in custom metadata. And, uh, and, and you could have many incarnations of custom metadata. So two different applications may look at the same exact file in a different way, depending upon what part of the value chain that particular file uh, is, is associated with. So here's an example of a class of video. Okay? Um, so one person looks at it and says, oh, here are all the, the policy holders in this region, and I'm going to put that into my metadata. And another one looks at it, you know, after a uh, hurricane or devastation, and says, oh, you know, here's the metadata associated with the claims for all those houses associated with it. Uh, so, so we've got the concept of metadata built into an object store, which is great, because now FIMS also has a concept of object. Right? Um, so, so now we got to figure out, is the FIMS concept of object similar to that of a object store? If not, what else is needed in order to create a repository that services all of the requirements of the FIMS standard? Okay, um, so in addition to custom metadata, FIMS is, is, uh, requires queries. So, for example, I want to say, can you get me all the movies with Quentin Tarantino as an actor? And um, uh, as an actor only, right? So you need to be able to go into the metadata and use the query engine and pull out those content. But sometimes the metadata queries need to be more sophisticated. Right? So, so, okay, um, now I just want him as a director. Can you pull out more files only where he's a director? So it pulls out two other movies. Right? But then you can have structured metadata queries where you say, give me all the movies where Quentin Tarantino is an actor and a director. Right? So, so those kinds of attributes have to be built into the XML files of the custom metadata uh, to be able to address these complex structured metadata queries. And so now you have these two. So uh, this is the kind of powerful intelligence that the object storage already contains, right? So you don't have to build it outside of the object storage. So the, um, the object store is context aware, and it's, it's got uh, structured and custom metadata abilities. OK. Uh, what else do we need out of an object store? It would be nice if there are some additional tools that can extract metadata from video files. And not only extract the metadata, because if you have an MXF file, the bitrate and, uh, and the GOP size, for example, uh, the quality, so not just extract the dead metadata that's built into the compressed stream, but also enhance it and, and add it to the custom metadata fields. Um, so these are the kinds of things now we're able to bring to the table as a starting point for consideration as a FIMS repository. There may be external policies, right? so put hold on certain number of files. Uh, so you may want to 
pick those kinds of actions. So now that you have um, all of these intelligence properties, we know that the object storage now completely distinguishes itself from a pretty dumb bit bucket. So this is not your you know, grandfather's storage, which is just a file or a block, which stores the, uh, uh, the database. So, you know, when we built the object store, of course, uh, it was not built from the point of view of, you know, complex media projects. Uh, so when FIMS com comes along and the technical board and the business board decides that these are the kinds of characteristics we want out of that, we have to try and reconcile the FIMS object model to the storage object model. So what are the features can be used? Uh, now, FIMS requires maybe things like EIDR compliance or, uh, you know, it's got its own unique ID model. So how do you implement unique IDs in the object store? So in, in the object store, usually, at, at least in our case, the, the name is a unique ID. You cannot have, you know, two objects the same name. So can you take that into consideration and create the unique IDs? Um, what kind of object relationships are possible? So the... Uh, the object store object is very granular, right? But whereas PIMS requires kind of complex hierarchies. Uh, you want parent-child relationships. Uh, a DVD project may have, you know, hundreds of thousands of files that are associated with the project. So, of course, each of those can be an object, but you need to maintain an external database, sort of a, a thin client, where you maintain the relationships between these objects and as a result, the combination of the adapter that implements the features that are not in the object store, such as the higher level relationships, combination of that plus the object store can completely abstract out the complexities uh, of what is required from a repository. So from a workflow point of view, you don't have to learn what the Hitachi object store is capable of doing. You don't have to learn the APIs, the REST APIs. Um, so, of course, you, know, we, you also want to exploit the query engine. So now, Loic uh, does not have to implement queries as an external software, right? As a result of some, many of these considerations, um, we, are, we think that the object storage from Hitachi is a really good fit compared to just a standard file-based storage. Of course, the work has to be done, including um, some interesting questions that Loic brought out. Uh, you know, how do you deal with versioning and, and how do you deal with growing files, right? And how do you deal with the disparity between the access requirements for production storage versus archive storage? Um, so these are the things that, that we have scoped out. Um, and uh, Loic is going to talk about, you know, how, what, how he's approaching the implementation of this thin client adapter and once we get more input from our customers as to what is good for version one implementation, we think that we can build this adapter and promote it to our customers. So, so with that, um, I want to hand it over to Loic, who's going to talk about uh, the actual implementation using the REST APIs that we supplied to him. And also, um, we're going to be building some kind of an SDK on top of that so that his job is not that difficult. Okay? Uh, but still, he does his knowledge of the FIMS standard combined with the Hitachi's knowledge of the object store is going to result in um, the adapter. Okay, so uh, here's a quick pictorial of what the adapter appliance looks like, and I'm going to let uh, Loic finish off with this picture and then jump on to his presentation on the considerations of building the adapter. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So before I switch to slides and actually switch to presentation uh, on completely, um, what you see on the screen right now is a very high level descriptions of the adapter and what it fits within the, uh, the Itachi product. Uh, we're going to go into the details in terms of what's in the green box there, what's been implemented and how things uh, really work. But before we do that, I want to take a step back and go back to provide a bit more information 
um, regarding Films itself, the repository interface. Because you're going to see that it's very important to, uh, to understand what that interface does and what it's capable of doing in order to pro properly extract uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the needed operations in order to expose a storage as a Films repository service. A film repository service can run on top of, obviously, a storage system, a MAM product, post-productions. Um, what we're going to cover here is only storages. What are the design considerations that you have to keep in mind when you implement the film repository interface on top of the storage? Okay. So first thing, not all storage systems are created equal. You have to realize that. Um, as the, the lead of the Films repository project. Uh, I was asked many, I've been asked many, many times. You now, what do I need to do to expose my product as a Films repository service? Well, it depends. You know, the amount of work that you have to do may be extremely minimum or can be extremely large. It depends of what you're starting with. Okay. When it comes to storage types, there's actually uh, five different categories that we have listed here. The first one is the one that we all know that is the file storage system. So it's basically a, a hard drive where you can store files, nothing more than that. Okay? Or a NAS system or even a, a sand-based storage. Then you have the object storage. So already um, the percentage of storage products that are fully object-based is very, very, very small compared to file storage. Okay? Uh, object storage means that there's many things that are treated at the file level that are quite different, where you don't talk about file anymore, you talk about object. Then there's that gray category that I describe as the light object storage. So those are the products that came from being a file storage that want to be an object-based storage, but they're not fully there yet. Then you have cloud storage that add another level of complexity on top of that. Uh, due to the fact that, well, they are not on your premises, they're somewhere in the cloud. So security authentications, the way you interact with the storage is also quite different. You also have another category that is the broadcast storage. So those are the, uh, those, are those dedicated systems um, that we have used in media that may be very powerful but also have a lot of limitations. So uh, taking that into consideration, um, if you take one of those, if your product is belong to one, or maybe could actually belong to more than one category in here, what you have to do in order to expose it as a Films repository uh, service? Well, uh, let's take a look at the capabilities that, that, will be, that, that, that will be needed in order to do that. First of all, does your storage um, has the ability to do file and object versioning? Well, with the file storage, you can see that that's not really the case. Uh, metadata support, that's not even that's not available. Same thing for custom metadata. API, forget about the API for object and file management and the query support. But it supports large, large files. Support it, it supports uh, large files. You can store files that are extremely extremely large. Is it optimized for media? Not really, due to the fact that you can store the files, but you cannot. You have no information regarding the, the metadata. Obviously. Uh, this is the storage type that has the least amount of features in our, um, in our table here. Uh, that's also the one that, is the, that has the lowest cost. So looking at the other storage types now that are listed here, uh, object storage has got a lot of the capabilities, but it fails in dealing with large files. Okay. Because they were not intended to store media files in the first place. They were intended to store document. When it's a document, talking about file-based document. So if anyone has a Word document that is more than 5 gig, I would like to see it. Okay. Uh, Optimize for media? Absolutely not. You know, in terms of the, letter, in term of the interactions of uh, the op in term of the interaction with media for the ingest and the retrieval of those the large files, not very optimized for that at all. Then you get the light object storage. So once again, those are the products that came from being a file-based system that want to be object-based. Um, typically, the type of actions, the type of operations you can do with the metadata are fairly limited. Okay? But some of those, op those uh, operations operation actually are supported. 
uh, most of them actually support metadata. When I say support metadata, metadata there's a way of describing a given file with metadata. Uh, custom metadata is often very limited, so you have to retrofit whatever you have with what the product provides. Uh, name value pair is extens extensively used with this type of product. Uh, there's also, and most of the time as well, an API that uh, provides limited functionality on top of the storage system. Uh, query is supported for the few metadata elements that are available. Uh, large for support and optimized, uh, optimized for media, not really, due to the fact that uh, um, the API uh, uh, are uh, basically the mechanism in order to, that, uh, that has to be used in order to uh, deal with a file uh, upload or file retrieval, and that those API rarely support files that are more than 5 gig. Cloud storage, well, it's pretty much the same thing under light object storage there, um, except for the fact that uh, uh, there's even more limitation when it comes to, uh, to metadata. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, there are cloud storage solutions that have a bit, bit more capability. This is uh, a description of what exists in general within this type of uh, storages. And then you have the broadcast storage. Uh, broadcast storage is very, very good at dealing with large files and optimize some media in a way that is, they, can in, they can ingest and that can be content retrieval extremely efficiently and quickly. Okay. So where does the Itachi SCP product that Jay presented fit within this table here? Well, um, it's got the ability to deal with object with file and object versioning. It also has metadata, metadata support. It even supports custom metadata, but the custom metadata is not structured in a way that it can truly really represent media. Okay. Uh, there's an API for object and file management. Okay. That's, that's a thumbs up on that one. The query uh, uh, engine built within the HTTP product is actually uh, uh, very rich in terms of its feature set. And that was pretty much a direct match in terms of exposing that uh, to the capability of the film repository query operation. It also has support for large files. Uh, but in terms of being optimized for media, well, it doesn't deal well with growing content. Uh, in terms of the speed of uh, ingest and retrieval, it's not exactly what you will expect uh, from a true production system. But it's perfectly fine for archive. Okay. Now, adding the, the, the appliance on top of the HCP uh, product uh, basically enable that uh, uh, that underlying product to be more compliant with everything uh, that has to be enabled in order to support media. Okay, um, especially around the way media is represented as metadata within the product itself. So let's take a look at the uh, um, first what it means to represent media within uh, within films. And second, we'll cover uh, the direct mapping of what is to be implemented uh, in order to represent a storage system as a films repository. Okay. So the best way to understand how films represent media is to look at an example. Okay. This is a sample films asset. You can see right here that there's actually three different layers. Uh, those layers, starting by the PM content type, uh, represent uh, the, um, the relationship that exists within an asset and an essence within themes. So the BM content type has a section where you can represent identifiers. Themes doesn't have limitations in terms of how many identifiers you can use to represent the media. Okay? So if you have your internal uh, ID like it actually has, well, you can support that. That doesn't mean that that's the only one you can use. You can use identifier that may be coming from the outside of that product. You may also have some type of industry ID that needs to, uh, that you need to add, that, that you need to use in order to represent that, uh, that media asset. Well, you can easily do that. Then there's descriptive metadata. Um, that is very important for media, but when it comes to media files, that's something that's always forgotten. In order for the query engine to be uh, useful, and that you can actually find 
the asset that you're looking for in those millions of records that you have, uh, you need to have rich metadata, okay? And you need to be able to support descriptive metadata. Within the themes uh, asset, uh, you also have the ability to support multiple format. What I mean by that is, uh, within a single asset, you can have one of the representation of that asset that is your HD mezzanine, let's say that it's an MXF. Uh, that asset may also have a proxy. Um, that means that, well, that asset has two BM content format type. Uh, the one listed on the screen right now is, that's, that's a two megabit MPEG-4, uh, H.264 um, file. So that's typically something that you can use for pretty much digital, digital distribution here, okay? But you can have many of those. Uh, each of those formats can also have multiple BM essence locators. So what is that? Well, that MPEG-4 file may be stored within one volume of your storage, or maybe even stored in multiple volumes of that storage. Let's say that that storage has the capabilities of having multiple locations, and one is a primary and one is a secondary, well, you will have two BM essence locators representing the MPEG-4 file. So now, a theme's asset is all of that. It's not only the files, but it's the BM content types, all of the formats that are included in that asset, and all of the, the essences that, that uh, represent the physical files of that asset. Uh, the metadata structure that is used in films is heavily based on uh, EBU core. And that's basically, if you know EBU core, you will, I mean, you will, the name that I use there as the name of the property should be familiar to you. One component that is extremely uh, important within films is the ability to extend that schema. And it can easily be done by using the extension concept that is built at the foundation of films. And every single one of those categories of metadata can be extended to fit your needs. Okay? Extending the metadata does not invalidate the theme's interface. You don't break the contracts by doing that. Okay? So as a product, um, uh, you need to have the ability to extend the metadata if you, tru if you truly want to support themes. Okay? And that's valid for the themes repository interface as well, and that's valid for storage products that wants to implement the Films Repository interface. Okay. A very simple use case now, you know, in terms of why we, do, why we deal with object in Films and we don't deal with files. Well, in this example, we're taking content from one repository, we're transferring it to a transcoding form, and we're transferring it back to another repository. So think about taking information coming from your post-production, and you're storing it to your near line after you conform it to, your, uh, to a specific format. Okay. So what goes out of a given service is what comes in to the next one. That's the film's workflow. What is being sent from one service to the service is the object. As you take that step and that you execute uh, uh, that service, you add metadata to that object. As an example, before the transcode, you may have only one format. After the transcode, you will have now an, ad an additional format for that asset. You will just add that information to that object. You don't lose information in translations. When it comes time to s now save, or store, or persist that asset within the, the, the repository, the near line here, you also have to be able to persist all that information. So it is important that the support for metadata uh, and needs to be there for your product itself in, in order to uh, keep track of all of the data. If you're not able to store it, that means that the next item, the next step of that workflow, you know, is only going to be dealing with some of the metadata where you have an incomplete object. That's traditionally how file-based workflows are running today, where you only deal with the files and not the metadata. Uh, and if you have to deal with the metadata, what you end up doing is well, there's not a perfect fit in terms of what a service can do, an application can do on the metadata itself, and end up discarding it or storing it in a place where it shouldn't be. Okay. So definitely a big advantage in uh, dealing with objects when it comes to media services. Uh, it is very important for the repository to have the capability to store that, or that information will be lost. 
So going back to the first category of, of uh, storage uh, that I presented, that is a file-based storage. So if you take a, a file-based storage and expose it as a FIMS repository interface, it can be done. It will require quite a bit of work, but it can be done. Okay. Um, in fact, the, if you take a look at the FIMS 1.1 package, there's a sample implementation that is included in that package that does exactly that. It is a bit lightweight, but it does exactly what's on the screen right now. Okay. So what you have to do here. So first, FIMS is, you know, a web, it has a web service interface. It can be SOAP-based, it can be RESPIC. So you need some type of web services. You need some type of web server. The second thing is you're going to need some type of component that will do the file and meta data management. You're going to call an operation of the service that can be a, a create object, a create asset, or an add essence to a given, uh, uh, to a given repository. Uh, you need to take that and you need to translate that into something that um, can be divided once in terms of information that is strictly metadata that needs to be stored somewhere, and second, a place where you're going to be storing the files. Okay? So what you end up doing is creating a virtual catalog, uh, creating a catalog of content within the, the metadata database uh, that basically has pointers to where you end up putting those files on the file storage. Okay? So that's what that service will do. Okay. So at the end of the day, the file storage is nothing more than what exists today as a file storage, except that you're building that catalog of where you're putting that content within the file storage themselves. Uh, without the metadata database, that file storage is useless, because you lose the entire metadata about what is what and the, the representation of the BM content types. The direct access to the file storage shouldn't be done, meaning that accessing and moving files around by going around the FIMS interface will end up in corrupting your file system storage, your file storage. Second scenario, your um, storage system supports um, is an object-based storage. Well, that's a very easy implementation because Typically, those APIs contain all of the informations that are required from a FIMS repository interface implementations. It can deal with metadata, it can deal with files. The limitation that you're going to have, as I said, is typically on the file size. When you start dealing with files that are more than 5 gigs, well, you may not be able to, uh, to use that type of repository. Okay. In terms of the amount of time that it takes to do that, this is very simple, and it doesn't require a lot of time to take any object-based storage and, trans and expose them as a FIMS repository interface. So if you take a product that is uh, CMIS compliant, that's really strictly around document management, and you want to, uh, or CDMI, and you want to expose those things as a FIMS repository interface, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Okay. Now the light object storage as a FIMS repository service. So remember, the light object storage are those type of products that had started their life as a file storage, and API have been built on top of them to start exposing them as an object-based storage. They have limited functionality when it comes to metadata and, and, and definition of objects. So for some of the operations, the API can be used, but for other ones, you basically have to, uh, uh, to walk around it. Okay? So there's still some access that has to be done to the light storage in order to deal with files, where you move files around and you define files within the, the, uh, the object storage itself. Uh, one thing that is not really possible to do with any of the light storage system that I've encountered is they do not have the ability to create an object that points to multiple files. So the scenario that I gave before where you had an HD, MXF, and an MPEG-4 that represent the same asset, well, typically you cannot represent that. So the way you need to do that is you have to create an object as an XML file, and you have to store that within the system itself. Well, now the light metadata object store that comes to the product is only there to catalog the IDs. And you have one pointer that points to the XML representation of the BM content type, 
you have one pointer that points to essence number one, and you have another pointer that points to essence number two. Okay. Now, the um, Itachi platforms. So, what has to be done is uh, something that um, uh, was in between the object-based store and the light object-based storage. So, uh, we still have the web service there. We still have the service that does the files and meta management. Uh, the API has all the capabilities needed okay, in terms of doing file and um, uh, metadata management. Uh, one thing that did not exist within the product is the ability to do what I just described, where one object within the ETH store points to one file. So what we ended up doing was to create a, an XML file that represents the VM content type. Uh, due to the fact that their query API that they had is fairly well um, capable when it comes to, uh, uh, to performance and to capabilities, we uh, created a, a mapping of the properties that are known as searchable from the BM content type into the properties um, of the Itachi searchable uh, parameters. And from there, we also uh, created the links uh, to the uh, XML files and to the underlying uh, essences that represent that asset. Okay. Uh, the implementation was fairly easy. Uh, still, I mean, it's, the appliance is still being developed, the designs and where we stand today. Uh, it, it is something that is actually not very complex at all due to the fact that there's a lot of capabilities that comes built in out of the box within the REST API provided by the product itself. Uh, the, on the query side, that is the most complex operation that you have to implement, well, you didn't have to do anything custom, like Jay mentioned already. Uh, in terms of the interactions for the files and uh, uh, for the object itself, except the fact that we have to create that XML file to represent the BM content type, well, it was a perfect match. So that's basically the green box that you had seen within the first uh, presentations. Okay, now time for the demo. Okay, so what I have here is a very, very simple uh, web-based application. Okay, um, that's the tip of the iceberg. Behind that, there's the three scale appliance or service uh, that interact with the uh, Itachi um, product. The interaction is done to the Itachi REST API. So uh, we're going from uh, our applications to a REST API on the adapter, that's, that is the Fims adapter, adapter, to another REST API that is the Itachi uh, product. So I'm just going to uh, exercise a couple of operations here. Okay, so I want to create a new asset. Uh, set uh, NAB 2015. Category things. The date. 04, 14, 15, I save it. So what I have done now is that I have created an object within the Itachi product. Okay. Uh, this, the object was created. There's two things that currently exist in the Itachi product. One, there's an object that belongs to the uh, Itachi object store and it's an XML file that represents the BM content type. Okay? Now you can see that that BM content type doesn't have any essences. So let's add one. folder here. Okay. 
let me go back here. And let me add it. Okay. So now, what's happening behind the scene? Um, it's done already. The uh, add essence operation has been called on the repository interface. Uh, the essence data sheet system uh, is has ingested or was ingesting that asset in done already. It's an asynchronous operation that it just finished and has sent back a notification uh, that the, the adapter has been querying Itachi to see if the, the file was available. It's available and then has sent a notification back to the client saying that the operation has completed. Okay? And I can see that from here. here. Now, let me go back to So that's the um, that's a folder that represents the location, a known location within uh, the Fims repository. It's called, I mean, it's, it's known as the outgest folder. So when you do a retrieve operations, that's basically where the file is going to end up. Remember, the repository is fully managed uh, through the interface, so you don't have direct access to the files. So I want to retrieve that essence and I want to copy it into that folder. So let's do that. Okay. And it's right here. So through that, quick demo, I've created an object. I've created some metadata of the object. I added an essence. And then uh, I retrieved the essence and I could, I could be back from, uh, uh, from the repository itself. What you see here on the left hand side is the format. You can see that there's some basic pro technical metadata property that will be extracted on that format upon the ingest. It is an MXF file and that's the size of the file. So that's, that's about it for the demo. I mean, one thing to remember is if you have to implement a, a film repository interface on top of the storage product, well, first, uh, you truly really have to understand the capabilities of your product. And then, you know, you can pick one of the recommended options. At this point, I would like to uh, Open the questions. If there's any questions in the group here? Thank you.